Oh, hello. I am Anri of Astor. This is Horace. Are you too in We are well along the road of sacrifices. Below us is the crucifixion woods. Beyond the flooded woods lies Farron Keep, home of the undead legion. Further yet is the Cathedral of the Deep. We seek the may go the name. Oh, he's not very don't think it without it. We are well along beyond the we may go the next may. We are beyond the next
easy beans on toast gaming thief class bang bang gonna get the black bow of Paris in this in this in this session I know it's in um I wanna use a different weapon but I don't know what achieved 25 wins, three world championships, and became the first and so far only world champion to Very come well out of done. retirement and win the title. Not bad for a pay driver, eh? Well Hold on a second, I see you sat there not subscribed to this beautiful WTF1 YouTube channel. Well, please do click that red button because we have an amazing F1 season coming up with brand new regulations ah. and we are going to be putting out so much content. So please do subscribe. Love ya. Michael Schumacher. It's mad to think that my goat, the greatest of all time, Michael Schumacher, actually started his F1 career as a pay driver. After working his way up through karting, he came to the attention of car manufacturer Mercedes-Benz, who financed the young lad through German Formula Ford and Formula 3. Jochen Niersbach, Mercedes competitions director, then decided to create their very own junior team, consisting of the top three in the 1989 German F3 Championship. Heinz Harald Frenzen, Karl Wendlinger, and unsurprisingly, Michael Schumacher himself. Instead of taking the traditional route through Formula 3000 up to Formula 1, Schumacher and the others joined their world sports car team in 1990, with Michael continuing to impress. This proved to be a Jordan F1 driver Bertrand Gachet was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment for aggravated assault. This left his team boss Eddie Jordan without a driver 10 days before the 1991 Belgian Grand Prix. The search was on with the boss wanting to bring in the 1982 world champion Keke Rosberg, despite the fact he'd retired five years earlier. 
Their attention eventually turned to the little-known 22-year-old Michael, especially as Michael's manager, Willie Webber, told Jordan a bit of a porcupine that had driven at Spa around a hundred times before, which was a complete lie. Michael had never driven there. Following a test at Silverstone that cost Michael and Mercedes £80,000, Eddie Jordan wanted Michael to pay for the privilege of racing for them to the tune of £150,000. Niersbach wasn't keen on the idea, having already been in talks with Benetton about a potential seat for 1992, something which would come to light a few months later. However, Ashen not wanting to miss out on the opportunity and planning to rejoin F1 in the near future, Mercedes-Benz guaranteed the £150,000 for the seat, with advertising disguised through their sponsors Decra and Tic Tac to avoid a clash with Jordan's Ford-powered engines. Eddie Jordan even admitted that the reason they took Bloody Schumacher over yeah. other options was the money Mercedes-Benz were willing to pay. Although his F1 debut didn't quite go to plan, retiring on the first half of block problems, he had showed his potential already. He had outqualified his experienced teammate the Jeff in seven tenths of a second. The following 307 starts and seven world titles shows that not all paid drivers are bad. Fernando Alonso. Despite a strong junior career, Fernando Alonso would never have gotten his F1 career off the ground without the financial assistance of one Flavio Briatore. Spotting his potential as a future talent, the Renault boss helped find the necessary funding to secure him a role as Minardi's test and reserve driver in 2000, before moving him up to a race seat with them the next year, even though the team were uncompetitive. The funny thing is, Fernando Alonso's teammate for that year, Carlo Marx, he paid a five-figure sum to beat Fernando's teammate that year. So really, he was the real pay driver of the team. Eventually, Alonso was promoted to a Renault race seat in 2003 and was <laughs> the number two champion for the team, becoming the youngest world <laughs> champion at the time. Now, rather than paying for a seat, it was the family talent that did the talking. The money followed him rather than the other way around. For example, when Alonso joined Ferrari in 2010, Spanish bank Santander hopped the board as well. It proves that most drivers need a helping hand to get their big break. We now move on to honourable mentions. These four may not have an F1 title to their name, but they're still pretty good drivers. Sergio Perez. It's strange to think of Sergio Perez as anything but deserving of his seat. But when Checo made his F1 debut with Salva back in 2011, the Mexican was immediately labelled as a pay driver. This was no surprise, since around the age of 14, he had the backing of Mexican billionaire and telecoms giant Carlos Slim, with Telmex sponsoring the team to the tune of $26 million per year. but it was all under the Telmex umbrella. Perez's future McLaren in 2013 was particularly well received as the paid driver label stuck when he was dropped for 10 times in the season. It was hailed as a victory for talent over cash. Yet his time at Force India and Racing Point proved that despite the money he brought, Checo was more than just a pay driver. Continuing to extract performances out of the midfield car, Perez and the team were celebrated as underdogs for their achievements on a much smaller budget than many of their rivals. Sergio's funding helped keep the team alive and competitive, and when the team went into administration Jeez, in 2018, Checo's decision to start legal action saved the company, allowing Lawrence Stroll to purchase Bloody it and turn it into that. the Aston Martin team we see on the grid now. Interestingly, despite Perez's move to Red Bull recently, his big sponsors are still there. You can catch the names Inter, Protection, Infinium, Claro, Telcel and Telmex dotted all over their livery. They may not have been a factor in Christian Horner's decision, but they always sweeten the deal. Rubens Barrichello. Shot Brazilian driver after Ayrton Senna, Rubens Barrichello gained support from food company Arisco during his junior days, which stayed with him throughout his early F1 career. Funnily enough, though, his debut came courtesy of the same team that gave his future Ferrari teammate Michael Schumacher his first F1 start. Jordan. Eddie Jordan had already had the future seven-time champion slip through his fingers after his debut in 1991 and was looking to bring the next new talent up through the ranks. Impressed by his progression through the Junior Series, Jordan gave Rubens his own F1 debut in 1993, aged 20, thanks to the $2 million backing provided by Arisco. He eventually went on to race for Stewart, Ferrari, and Williams, across the 
held the record for the most race entries until Kimi Raikkonen overtook him at the 2020 Eiffel Grand Prix. Something which shows he had the talent to deserve to stick around on the Formula One grid, not just the one he Mark Webber. Helped to get their start in Formula One. At the time, the Benetton team owner gave Mark Webber his first shot as the team's test and reserve driver for the 2001 season. When the opportunity arose to race for Minardi in 2002, his manager Briatore once again assisted him, even if he did complain that the Yachts did nothing to support Webber. Though that wasn't actually true, his sponsors Ron Walker and telecoms company Telstra provided the backing to get Mark to break through. His initial contract was just the first two races in 2002, but they managed to get him a full 17 Grand Prix deal that season. Weber later went on to take nine wins and 42 podiums, finishing third in the Drivers' Championship on three occasions in 2010, 2011 and 2013. Not bad for a number two driver. There you have it, a look into when F1 pay drivers were actually pretty damn good. So you start an F1, no surprise, but you can change your view on pay drivers in Formula 1. Let us know in the comment section below. Last few races we have started to see little cracks in the relationship between Valtteri and Mercedes. It's an interesting dilemma that will definitely test the mettle of Toto Wolf, Mercedes and the relationship and trust between the two drivers. So is it time for Bottas to think only for himself even if it costs Lewis and Mercedes the drivers championship and is Bottas done playing the number two role before he leaves at the end of the season? of Bottas's time at Mercedes. In Monza, he showed that even up against Hamilton and Verstappen, he could always pull off a stunning quality lap to clinch pole, and in the race with the quickest car on track, he delivered a close to flawless comeback drive as he cut his way through the field to finish on the podium after starting from the back. And then came Sochi and Valtteri, as he always does after a great result, fell right back down to earth. In practice, he was the class of the field, edging moves in every single session. And although both the Mercedes were caught out, it was Valtteri who qualified lowest, down in seven. In the race, he had a chance to repeat his incredible comeback drive from Monza, but instead he got stuck in traffic way down the order, and if you look at where he was on lap 46, which was before all of the rain chaos kicked off, Valtteri was down to the And when you think about it, the fact that he started alongside Max Verstappen, the gulf in performance that they had, when you actually look at the race and their relative pace, was enormous. Now, I'm not trying to have a go about it. I'm just giving you my honest and brutal analysis of how he can go from looking like he has a championship winning pace in Monza to then being able to overtake an Alfa Romeo. That's what Valtteri is, and that's what he has been at Mercedes for the past five years. However, although Valtteri's time with Mercedes is ending, if they want to win the Drivers' Championship with Lewis, then they're going to need Valtteri to be on top of his game, and they'll need his support more and more as the championship reaches its climax. The reason for this is down to the crazy close championship we're having, and then also the fact that looking at the remaining races left, Red Bull look like they'll have a raw pace advantage for the main As of recording, the 
2020 Red Bull, he took a dominant win, and arguably it was that win in the very last race of the season that almost started his championship challenge this year because it gave the team a huge boost of confidence going into the winter break. Well, and so, yet again, you've well, got to look at that as another Red Bull track. All of this how well, Alpha really being able to win the championship, they will need Valtteri to make up the deficit of the car, and at the end of the season gets closer and closer, I think Valtteri's role as the Mercedes number two will get bigger and bigger. But, will Valtteri, if put in those positions again, continue to bow down to Mercedes, or are we going to see Valtteri go rogue a little bit and follow on from some of the cracks that we've been seeing in the last few races? In Zandvoort, when the team pitted him very late to put him on fresh tyres, he clearly ignored their team order to not go for the fastest lap at a single point, which took it away from Lewis. Now, Lewis in the end also a stop and did end up taking it back, but it was just a little bit of a crack starting to show with Toto trying to calm the situation.
Toilets and five. Oh, <laughs> Want to join the Mile High Club, last Yeah, we yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a very gentle lover. <laughs> lovely guy. Thanks a lot. So the, the BA stuff made me very, uh, very comfortable. And they always said you're welcome as well, Bob. Yeah, I'll be in the toilet. Not in this well, I mean, it, it, you should see me try and fit on an aeroplane toilet. It's, a, it's a really a sight to be seen. It's like that scene out of Jurassic Park, isn't it? Fuck yeah. me. It, like, what were the guys up there? Yeah. The T-Rex comes. <laughs> yeah. Just try it. Multiple games today. Chris Wood has three goals in his last 27 appearances. And that's prolific. And that's why he's and, yet, no. 30 mil on that. and yet, Booby, he's still not of the level of Andy Carroll, is he? It is very prime. Andy Carroll's got a big move to West Brom. He's going to get promoted, Andy Carroll. <laughs> has he really? Oh, right, okay. So, this is the, this is the ironic thing is uh, Steve Bruce has taken over at West Brom. Um, that break lasted, didn't it? That. That's the game. So terrible. The game. It's so yeah. bad for me. Yeah, after quick. Newcastle, I think I'm going to need a real train out of the game. Stevie Bruce has moved up by me. Pretty you pretty up if you want, mate. No one else will do. Yes, he's, he's managed right. everyone in Birmingham. He's managed nice. everyone in the North East. Hall as well. Proper loyal manager. Proper loyal manager. Most, most sought after. One of the most sought after. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. I bet if there was a picture, I'd be fucking crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, weirdly, Gary Lineker versus the Wolves. Aston Villa and Wolves are away at Spurs. <laughs> Three big games today, both all of them um, sort of deciding different things in the Premier League. Uh, two of them deciding who goes in the top four, if Liverpool can still challenge. And then obviously, um, there's you guys, Brian, against my boy. Oh, Stevie G, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm a bit concerned. We're, we're undefeated in four, which feels like a dream. Yeah. You know, it really does. When you say undefeated in four, you mean three draws and a win? I said we beat him before, lads. Like, oh, undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what I mean. Um, but the football's been much better, and we battered Everton the other day. Bullied the fuck out of them. Um, got a cheeky little follow off Kieran Trippier on that one. Why did but, you get a follow off Kieran Trippier? I just praised him, said the impact he's made at the club's been sensational. Immediate, you know what I mean? That's why Harry Maguire won't tell him. Yeah, yeah, he's literally <laughs> reading one. At some point, the guy could have fucking praised me. You could say the same thing. <laughs> Sensational. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, 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 in the last game for Newcastle, um, it was like a, a moment for me, a bit of a like, oh wow, like it was the first time where I've actually thought, oh I'm, I'm enjoying football in this
just slowly dragged West Brom further down yeah, to further prove my point. I mean, they're in the top eight, so uh, if they finish bottom half, I'm vindicated. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Bruce's style is very uh, championship the way Just with the West Brom, the, the manager who was there before was playing. Yeah. Like, I saw the Oh wow, so they went like for like then? That's <laughs> <laughs> but really, so just, just the we like where angling is going. Yeah. Oh, but I we do we like a club that really has a direct <laughs> football who knows this is what I'm sticking to. <laughs> and all of that, that energy was, was there, and I think Eddie has a huge credit for that. This Kieran, will be a Kieran Trippier, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Like, 
and I know Man United were linked with him about a year ago. I'm like, how on earth we've landed this guy? He's been right. in the in the relegation zone as well. Like the fans are now already like he's the top of Newcastle, and like when you look at the way the fans were screaming at that game, and there's a lot of criticism, wasn't there, from fans? Wait, that, you were the same thing. Oh, you were going to be linked to these oh. kind of exotic, you know, Hollywood kind of players. Oh, oh. Now, mainly I target. need a prop um, if you truly are. Yeah, and he's quality as well, but and he's got a bit of leadership about him as well. He seems like a good character. <laughs> Ridiculous, and I think you. I think we made a model of the table. That's, that's, that's coming in the summer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. quite possibly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's fucking hope so. Be a laugh, but um, <laughs> I mean, we're on the ride now. It's, I'm not driving, mm, um, yeah. but uh, I think the one thing that really worried me, though, and I, I see the road to Newcastle fans going, what a transfer window! Ten out of ten. I'm like, compared to Mike Ashley, yes. But when you look at our front four that we're relying on to get goals, you've got obviously Wood for the majority of the but season. Be careful, yeah. for a striker isn't great. Mm -hmm. Then Sir Maximin, who is like a twisted genius, but he's very twisted at the same time. Like, he'll have 88 minutes of absolute shite. But then the, the stats on this are, you know, and against Everton, he was unbelievable. But Joe Linden and Ryan Frazier, I, I went down to their like, light appearances in the league this season, like 40 or whatever it was. Um, in, in the uh, this season rather in, in all comps and it was like one goal and one assist between them <laughs> and and that alone when you're like yeah. there, there was opportunities to get a, a Jesse Lingard earlier done you went in for that French kid at the end of the window why did you leave it so late when we, you know, if anyone gets injured we still could get relegated here that's the so one, easily that's the one concern I would say is that the Jesse Lingard would have been would really nice oh, just to have that attacking midfielder that's the cherry on the cake yeah, yeah. yeah but you know, talk about Trippier there. Trippier has like.